chapter. Uh, it's a virtual meeting, but I'd still like to begin with uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we work on, uh, pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. Uh, now, today we have a really great program for today's session, uh, but I'd just like to start by giving a quick update about chapter activities. So a few weeks ago, we held the chapters AGM, uh, and that brings about a transition in roles on the council. Uh, so first I'd like to thank the outgoing council members, that's Jason Mattingly, Natalia Erogova, and Max Shine for all their hard work in handing over uh, what is really a thriving chapter despite all the challenges that have been posed by COVID. Uh, and I'd like to welcome the incoming committee members. So that's Rishma Vijasega as secretary, uh, Dil Razi as treasurer, and Alex, Puck, Alex Puckett, Johanna Bayer, and Kelly Garner, who was staying on as the EMCR representatives. Uh, and I also, also congratulate our incoming elect committee members. So our chair elect, which is Marta Garrido, our secretary elect, Valentina Lorenzetti, and our treasurer elect, Johanna Bayer along with our incoming EMCR representatives elect, that's Stefan Bollman, Arina Arnatkevichutia, Ye Tian, and James Pang. So uh, congratulations, those guys, and uh, we look forward to working together. Uh, we had our first council meeting as a collective a couple of weeks ago, and we're really actively trying to work on ways of trying to keep the community connected throughout the pandemic. It's still up in the air as to whether we'll have an in-person meeting next year. Uh, that we'll have to just wait and see. But we are committing to trying to hold regular sort of every two to three month webinars on different topics. And we're really interested in getting uh, feedback from the community. So we've set up a web poll. So I'd encourage you to go to this link. We will email the link out to the membership, um, but you can just visit uh, the chapter website and you'll see a little um, tab for web poll. And that just has a bunch of topics that the committee has uh, suggested. And you can just vote uh, for which topic you would like to see in a webinar. And that will help shape the way we, we think about planning this webinar series over the next year or so. Uh, they're the major updates. So with that out of the way, we can talk about today's webinar. So the focus today is on big data and neuroscience. And I guess in many ways, you could say that we're living in a golden age of brain imaging with the public release of really lots of different large population scale brain imaging data sets, you know, starting with the HCP and spin-off projects, but culminating most recently in kind of really mega scale projects such as the Biobank and the ABCD study. So we thought it would be timely to discuss the opportunities and the challenges that uh, these data can bring. And we've got a great lineup of both uh, international and Australian speakers. Uh, so without further ado, I will uh, hand over to our first keynote speaker, and that's Professor Michael Brakespear at the University of Newcastle. Uh, Michael is currently Editor-in-Chief at NeuroImage and well known for his diverse contributions to different aspects of cognitive neuroscience, bio biological psychiatry and computational modelling of large-scale brain networks. Uh, he's also a lead CI on a major Australian brain imaging project on aging and dementia. And that's going to result in a really exciting publicly available data bank. And that's what he's going to talk to us more about today. Uh, so over to you, Michael. Thanks, Alex. Uh, let me just get uh, share screen capabilities here. Okay, how's that? Great. Okay, well look, thanks to Alex and the other organisers of today's webinar and to RHBM Australia and uh, all um, people signed in. I'm going to run through the prospective imaging study of ageing, uh, which was funded from the NHNMRC's Dementia Research Grant. Um, in total, I think there was $400 million of funding spread through fellowships and special um, research projects such as PISA. Uh, it started when I was at QIMR um, and I'd like to acknowledge all the other investigators and researchers on this project. Uh, large contributions to the inception by Christine Gow, who's now in the United States and Nick Martin um, and the other investigators that you can see. 
And I uh, really like to acknowledge the people who have made it work, particularly Kerry McAllany, Jessica Adset, Natalie Garden, and Michelle Lupton. Okay, as I'm sure most of you know, considerable research now to discloses that neuropathology in Alzheimer's disease precedes the clinical manifestations by some decades. This reflecting the remarkable capacity of the brain to continue to function in everyday skills despite loss of considerable underlying neuro neural tissue. And this is a cartoon many of us have seen with those of whom are developing Alzheimer's uh, <clears throat> underlying pathology um, increasing for up to 15 years, maybe longer before there's a functional decline. And what traditionally has happened is that people come into memory clinics often because their carers or co-workers have noticed something wrong. It's not always with memory. It can be with language and executive function. And from the memory clinics in the last 10 or so years, people have been recruited into clinical drug trials. But I look at this from a, if it was a cardiac disease, people would have an ejection fraction of about 30%. And even if you prevent further progression of the disease, with the degree of underlying neuropathology, it's impossible to sort of uh, restore healthy cognitive function. <clears throat> so what we really want to do is capture these people on the upswing of the disease, high risk, healthy midlife adults. And they, these cohorts, her cohorts hold the potential to identify the early disease mechanisms. It's still unclear, depending who you talk to, whether tau and amyloid are disease mechanisms or consequences and in particular, new therapeutic windows. We achieved this through a collaboration with the geneticists at QIMR by looking at um, updates in gene, genome-wide association studies of dementia. Uh, most of you will know that APOE is a, an enormous uh, risk variant, but there are uh, scores and now hundreds of common genetic risk variants, each of less penetrance. Uh, but if you add, the, add them up, if you do a general linear model and you add up the beta weights, you can stratify people into risk deciles, which is what we do here. And the people in the highest risk decile have an odds ratio of about 10 times that of the lowest decile. But note the enormous confidence intervals here. So it's a long way from being any sort of precision prediction algorithms. However, we can enrich samples. And the goal of this project is then to build personalized and precision risk algorithms. <clears throat> so in this study, we have a population cohort of 2000 people with shallow phenotyping and about 300 and as you'll see eventually more with deep functional and molecular imaging. And as well, we've recruited people from memory clinics with mild cognitive impairment and AD. And these are principally aged 40, 45 to 70 or 75. Uh, so they're younger, they're generally healthy. Um, and um, first uh, thing, we uh, do a extensive, um, we, we redo the genetic, um, we do online and in-person neuropsych, we do imaging, uh, we do a metabolic profile and we do uh, a lifestyle assessment as well. Uh, it sort of looks like this. I won't have time to go through the details, but the gray box at the top is an existing large cohort that Nick Martin has studied for many years. Uh, people now in their 40, uh, four, four to eighth um, decade, many of them twins. Uh, <clears throat> Kerry and others have made contact and recruited several thousand, close to 3,000 um, in for a survey and online cognitive testing. And then depending on um, the, the uh, genetic testing, we recruit um, about 300 in for the in imaging. Just to give you an idea, has this worked? Uh, this is what the population genetic profile looks like. I won't go through the details, but the gray are people at low to medium genetic risk. And the colors are people at high polygene risk score or moderate genetic risk, but APOE positive. That's the various colors. When we enrich them and bring them in 
uh, for the much more expensive neuroimaging and phenotyping and molecular imaging, we ended up with a pie chart that looks like this. And you can see that the gray piece of pie, the, the low risk or the medium risk of dementia has got much smaller. And the interesting colorful genetic risks have got much larger. We did want some people at low to medium risk to have a sort of general population sample across the spectrum of risk. <clears throat> As I said, they do an online questionnaire uh, that we built. Um, it's got a general core module that everybody does. And then there's uh, 11 additional modules, each of which take between two and 10 minutes. We've had thousands of people do all of these modules. So this is a nationwide um, cohort now. Um, and uh, we have lots of genetic and lifestyle risk factors. Uh, the people who come in uh, come to initially to Brisbane to the Hurston Imaging Research Facility where we have a Siemens Prisma. Uh, we spent a lot of time developing a 60 minute protocol that captured all the interesting aspects of the uh, Human Connectome project um, as much as we could in 60 minutes. And uh, there was a lot of testing and refining, but we basically, we do do a quick abdominal scan, but we do a a T1 weighted, T2 weighted, MP2 rage, and a 3D flare. These are structural scans, a multi-echo gradient scan for um, uh, iron scanning, um, multi-shell high angular resolution diffusion scan, and we also do task fMRI in this one or so hour. It's a little bit over an hour. And the base structural scans are one millimeter isotropic. Uh, we have a PET MR sitting in the same facility. So this is like a Skyra. So it's a 3T scanner with a PET insert or an integrated PET system. So the interesting thing here is we can do a amyloid radioligand called fluorobetabine. And that's about um, a 30, 40 minute scan. Um, but at the same time, we can do resting state fMRI and we can do resting state ASL as well. So we're uh, pinching the best of both worlds while we do the PET-MR and that's our resting state acquisition, but it's a two second TR. Um, uh, this is an example of the amyloid scan that the par our partners at the CSRO provide us uh, with a example, low, medium and high amyloid burden. And um, we have found that people at high genetic risk have a 2.5 fold risk of having amyloid, um, high amyloid burden, even though they're healthy and living in the community. Uh, very quick survey, here's the abdominal scan. Uh, we get an image of visceral fat, which is a good biomarker of cardiovascular risk. Um, this is our T1 weighted map to look at um, uh, volumetric, morphometric, um, other imaging. Uh, a flare from which we can do uh, white matter segmentation um, a multi-echo GRE for quantitative susceptibility mapping for iron, as I said before. Um, a multi-shell Hardy type uh, diffusion sequence for tractography. Um, and um, after some discussion, uh, we do a task um, fMRI as the main part of the imaging. We have the resting state in the other half. Uh, people during the structural images, watch a series of um, the first half of 18 news clips. Um, and then during um, the acquisition of fMRI data, they watch the second half uh, of 18, only nine of which they've seen the first half. So nine of these clips, they're like, oh, okay, I get it. This is the second half of what I've seen before. And nine are matched for content and uh, visual stimuli, uh, but they lack the context of the first half. And um, Christine and Udan, uh, Ren and I had done already a study of this in healthy controls to show that uh, watching the second half of continuing clips was a potent activator of the hippocampus. And that correlated with subjective metacognition as well, but that's another story. Uh, they do a two week lifestyle assessment. We put this sleep monitor under their bed and we can stage uh, sleep and restlessness. 
and uh, they wear an act, uh, activity watch so that we can look at uh, physical activity as well. Uh, this all in collaboration with the CSIRO. Uh, so that's basically a flying uh, view of our prospective imaging study of um, ageing. Uh, the data is coordinated across the various institutes, uh, lives in various forms within the CSIRO on their red cap system. Um, and ideally, and this is much more challenging than you might think, uh, we can retrieve data uh, with a search engine and um, share it again with our principal collaborators, much of which has already gone through uh, standard pre-processing pipelines, human connectome project like. Uh, that was a snapshot of the baseline, very comprehensive as you can see. We're now halfway through the two and a half year follow-up um, and we of course have aspirations to do much longer term longitudinal follow-up. Uh, but I just want to finish because uh, towards the end of this project I was contacted by some colleagues in Melbourne um, to become some part of something called uh, the Alzheimer's Disease Network of Australia. So this is PISA, it's Brisbane based. I've talked through the various imaging and lifestyle assessments. Uh, ADNET is basically a whole country approach with um, PISA-like components in the various capital cities. And we're now in our second year of rolling out PISA-like sequences uh, in all the major capital cities and setting up the sort of complex multi-institutional agreements and data sharing agreements um, in order to make uh, this a nationwide dementia project. And um, then screen people in collaboration with pharmacological clinical trials into these um, preclinical uh, clinical trial interventions. Uh, so I'll end there, um, hopefully in time. Um, and I'd just like to thank and acknowledge again uh, the tremendous work of um, the collaborators um, uh, pictured here and many who have come and worked on us um, since. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Michael. So it's a really uh, fascinating and interesting cohort. Uh, I'll just ask people to type questions in the chat. Uh, and we'll read them out. So we'll have a little bit of question time after each speaker, and then we'll have a bit more of an extended discussion at the end. Uh, if I could just get things rolling, Michael. So how are people able to access this data bank and in what way? Okay. So uh, in principle, yeah, I just show, by the way, if you want to read about that, you can um, stop share, sorry, and share again. Um, you can go, uh, hopefully you can see this preprint. Can you see the preprint? No. Uh, so you can um, get more details in the preprint. Uh, yes, now where I, of course, uh, it's, it's uh, publicly available. Um, now institutes are somewhat, we're somewhat captive to the ethics and research governance requirements of our employee employers. Um, I can't just put the data HCP-like into the public domain. Uh, you need to approach us um, and the two things we require are that you've got local ethics approval uh, to analyse data of this nature and you'll need a data transfer agreement in order to receive the data. Uh, we're not going to ask for people to submit complicated project approvals to make sure that we don't give away projects that we might want to do ourselves. It's freer than that. Uh, but people need to sign up that they're not going to, for example, try and de-identify their participants or on-share the data, um, that they're going to use the data in a, in a sort of broad scientific purpose and, and um, keep us um, updated with uh, um, progress as they um, submit. So it's more like an ADNI data sharing agreement. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and so they can find the contact details on the website? Yeah, you'll be emailing me or Michelle Lupton. Okay. Uh, we, th we then um, will supply you with a, uh, a, a project proposal, which we'll then share. And we've had um, a number of external applicants already, even to today. So 
it is a progress in motion. Great. I've got some questions in the chat. So one is, uh, I'm interested in your online cognitive testing protocol. Is this tailored to the study or is it an existing battery like the NIH toolbox or CANTAB? Yeah, look, great question, Laura. Um, I'd really like to say it's tailored to um, an imaging study of aging. It's uh, CANTAB and, and CBS, uh, the Cambridge, um, sorry, system. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> They're not great online assays of memory. Um, they're memory light, they're language and executive function heavy. Uh, we have done some multivariate analysis of how they overlap with the in-person and um, it's, it's encouraging, uh, but more so for language and executive dysfunction. Uh, we didn't use the NIH toolbox, but uh, part of the, pro, uh, part of the um, objective of PISA is actually to go backwards and design brief online inventories that are going to help us enrich samples for um, dementia. Uh, and so at the moment it's CPS and CANTAB. Right. Uh, another question, thank you for the talk. It's interesting that you have sleep sensors and smart watches. Have you analyzed the data and has it shown any relationship with information from MRI? Uh, yeah, there has been. Um, analysis of the sleep sensors. There's been cross-validation with other um, valid validated measures of sleep stage. Um, so that's been accomplished. There's been some cursory examination of um, structural and um, molecular correlates of sleep disturbance, but it's very, very early. Um, and the actigraphy um, has also been quality controlled. Um, but I can't answer Maya's question, what watches are you using? Because uh, I've um, used several different types of actographs and um, I should remember, but off the top of my head, um, I can't tell you what um, watch we're wearing, although I'm sure it's in the preprint somewhere. I won't try and scan it live. Brilliant. All right, well, that brings us to time. Uh, I ask anyone who else is interested to uh, think about your questions and uh, and we'll have an opportunity to come back at the end after all the speakers uh, have finished to, to uh, discuss. So thanks very much, Michael. Um, next up, we have Associate Professor Liana Schmal, who is Head of Mood Disorders Research uh, at Origin and the Centre for Youth Mental Health in Melbourne. Uh, Liana's also lead investigator on the depression and suicide working groups of Enigma, which is the world's largest uh, brain imaging consortium. And so she's got a wealth of uh, really fantastic experience in working as part of a large team and uh, dealing with huge data sets. And uh, I guess we're going to hear about some of that today. So thanks, Liana. Thanks, Alex. Let me just share my screen. And can you see the presentation? Yep. Okay, great. All right, thanks, Alex. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about the Enigma Consortium um, and specifically the Enigma Major Depressive Disorder Consortium. Um, but just first, before I go into that, I just wanted to briefly touch base on why do we actually need these kind of large scale um, consortium data or big data and um, I think some of this was already covered um, last webinar as well by, by the keynote speaker Ross Poldrack who, who joined but in general we, we kind of the goal of many of our neuroimaging studies is to link brain structure and function to behavioral cognitive or clinical phenotypes and because neuroimaging um, acquisition is very expensive and sometimes very difficult if, if, if you have complex um, clinical samples, um, the overall sample sizes of our neuroimaging studies are quite still limited. Um, so I think Russ presented this last time that um, in a review they did in 2017, where they basically obtained sample sizes from fMRI studies um, published in the last two decades, um, they showed that even in 2015, the median sample size of fMRI studies was still about 20 to 25. So still quite low, which also means that um, 
these studies are basically only able to detect uh, relatively large effect sizes. So for example, if you see this on the, on the graph on the right, um, even in 2015, um, the median kind of study was only able to detect these effect sizes of about Cohen's D of about 0.75 or higher. And this might not necessarily be a problem if, you know, the, the effects, the brain behavior relationships or the case control differences um, that we're looking for are actually, you know, have very large effect sizes. But it becomes problematic when the actual effect sizes are relatively subtle or like small to, to moder medium effect sizes, which is um, now what we see more and more um, with large samples is actually the case for many of the of the phenotypes that we're looking for. Um, and basically, um, the issue there is that if the true effect sizes are quite small, then small studies won't be able to pick them up. So um, they either produce false positives, or, or even if they actually detect an, a true effect, um, they tend to overestimate or um, the effect size. So this leads to a lot of false positives, but also false negative of, of underpowered studies um, and an overestimation of, of effect sizes if the, real, if the effects are real. And this again, in turn, leads to um, a lot of the findings that are not replicated, um, which we all know is the replication crisis or the replication failure. And of course, besides sample size, um, there are other contributors to, to this replication failure, like methodological variability, p-hacking, confirmation and publication biases. And also, this is not something unique to our field. Uh, we know this, this, these are very well-known issues in genetics, in, in psychology, in um, medicine. And I actually came across this paper. So even in, in the zebrafish research, um, re reproducibility and replicability issues are particularly problematic in zebrafish as they state here. So it's a very well-known phenomenon. But I just wanted to show you two examples um, that I think illustrate this very, very nicely, this issue. And um, one um, was published in 2016, uh, actually by Carla. So Carla might actually be talking a little bit more about this later on. Um, but this was based, so the graph on the left based on uh, UK biobank data, um, and on the on the right you see a paper that was just just uploaded to BioArchives the other day, um, using the ABCD data set. So both very large samples, um, about four to five thousand, that was used uh, for these these illustrations. But as you can see on the left, this is an association between age and um, uh, functional imaging. Uh, Foxels, so the, so the foxels that show the strongest association with age, and you can see with with small sample sizes. So even if you if you just change the sample size a little bit, there's a lot of variability in the actual effect size that you find, and it can even swap from um, positive effect sizes to negative. And you can see that with about 2,000 subjects, these kind of um, effect sizes stabilize. And the effect sizes are around minus 0.15 to, to plus 0.15 maximum. Um, so much lower than that kind of 0.75 effect size, um, although that was Cohen's D, but much smaller effect sizes than, than um, we would be able to pick up um, with small sample studies. And this is also nicely illustrated in this new ABCD um, study that um, they basically looked at the um, correlation between all kinds of neuroimaging measures and um, cognitive measures or measures of psychopathology. And again, they found in, in a very large sample, the overall effect sizes are really maximum around 0.15 and for psychopathology even lower. And as you can see in the middle here on the right, um, with small effect sizes, again, um, just purely due to sample uh, variability, the effect sizes, if you, if you go from one um, sample of 25 people to another random sample of 25 people, as you can see on the bottom, two random samples of 25 people, the same effect can have a, show a negative or a positive correlation uh, in completely the opposite direction. And again, that only kind of stabilizes 
uh, when you reach this thousand, two thousand kind of uh, subject um, sample size. So, I mean, this this is of course an an issue, and it means that um, a lot of the kind of findings or, or a lot of the underpowered studies have led to inconsistent and poorly replicated neuroimaging findings, both in healthy and diseased populations, um, including people with major depressive disorders, suicidal thoughts and behaviors, which is kind of the focus of my um, research. And of course, there's different kind of solutions to this. And, and, and one of them is just collecting a lot of data, like in UK Biobank or um, ABCD, um, if there is funding for it and, and the infrastructure is in place. Uh, an alternative way of, of kind of reaching very big sample sizes, um, and which is complementary, is, is pooling existing data. And that's something we've been doing in Enigma. Um, so Enigma was um, initially established as a, a imaging genetics consortium, uh, initially set up by Paul Thompson, Nick Martin, Marky Wright, Barbara Frank Franke and others. Um, with kind of the goal to detect genetic variants associated with uh, brain phenotypes. So the, similar to PGC, um, looking at clinical phenotypes, but in this case, the hope was that maybe using brain phenotypes as an intermediate phenotype, it would be easier to pick up um, these genetic variants. But then after the first studies were published, the GWAS studies, um, people just realized that a lot of the data actually come from people with um, mental disorders or neurological disorders. So this is how the first clinical working groups were uh, initiated. So we started off with MDD, bipolar, schizophrenia and ADHD working groups back in 2012. And by now there are many, many clinical working groups led by different people uh, within Enigma. I think this this one is actually already outdated because there's new working groups being initiated all the time. There are also non-clinical working groups. So um, like I said, the genetics working groups, but also um, working groups looking at development and aging in healthy populations, looking at sex and gender differences. And all these working groups are um, supported by more methods working groups um, who develop processing protocols, analytical protocols, um, just to make sure that um, the processing and, and some of the analysis are kind of standardized and similar across all these different uh, clinical and non-clinical working groups. So like I said, back in 2012, we started Enigma MDD. So we started off with about 12 sites for the first paper. Um, so we just asked anyone we knew with, with um, data on neuroimaging and clinical data from healthy people and people with um, depression to join. And um, we started off with, with a few sites, but by now it's, it's evolved into a collaboration between 43 um, research groups all around the world. Um, we have about data from about 5,000 people with MDD and about 10,000 healthy controls. And um, I have to thank uh, Elena Potsy here, who, who has been um, tremendous in, in helping me coordinate all of this, which, which is quite a, um, quite a lot of work. Um, so the general aims, kind of the initial aims of Enigma MDD was to identify kind of the brain imaging markers of MDD that can be, reli can be reliable, uh, detected and replicated across many different samples worldwide. So we really wanted to know what are those true effect sizes and what are really the robust and reliable findings of um, brain alterations in MDD. Um, and, and in addition to that, we also wanted to see how age, sex and different disease characteristics would influence these, these kind of brain alterations. And eventually, um, we're also very interested in, in not just looking at MDD, but see what is common and what is unique um, across the different mental disorders. So just to mention here, I think it's important that it's not a, Enigma is not a public data set. So it's different than, for example, ABCD or UK Biobank. It's not um, open to the, to the general public. It's not in the public domain. Um, anyone who has data on, um, 
on neuroimaging or clinical data uh, on depression can join. Um, people are asked to send a memorandum of understanding. Um, and this has um, includes kind of um, uh, guidelines or kind of behavioral codes for data sharing, etc. because we are very much limited to um, ethics and, and, and um, ethics restrictions of the individual members and sites. Um, so basically anyone can join and they can um, basically for every uh, project that is initiated, they can either um, uh, participate or not. So we use a, a, an opt-in system, which is different in Enigma MDD, uh, in different working groups can have a different system, but they can also initiate projects by writing an analysis plan. Um, and we do that just to make sure that um, plans are feasible, that people don't claim topics that, you know, that in five years later, nothing has happened because it's not feasible. Um, and the other thing is that we try to avoid overlap between the different projects. And um, this is all reviewed. If, if it's, if it's uh, approved by the members, then, then um, individual members can decide whether to participate in each project. Um, data will be shared and, and papers will be published. So originally we started off with a meta-analysis approach mostly for the first studies. And this is because um, I think back in 2012, we felt that if we would just go and ask everyone to share all the raw data with us, um, we, would, we weren't sure whether people were very willing to do that. So we thought we, it's important to build trust. It was a little bit of a different time then as well. So we thought if we um, just ask them to participate in the meta-analysis, so they process the data themselves and analyze the data themselves locally uh, using the standardized scripts, Enigma scripts that we sent them and they share the results with us and we run a meta-analysis um, that might convince more people to join. Um, and that was done for the first few studies. Um, nowadays, we run more mega-analysis. We still don't really have the raw data from sites, but um, we do have individual level data from a lot of um, kind of brain derived features um, like free surfer or other measures, DTI measures, etc. So we've published um, in the last years about um, 12 papers. So the first one was in 2015. And really the first papers, like I said, were really looking at these case control differences in subcortical brain volumes, subcortical shapes, um, cortical um, differences. And you can see the increase in, in kind of the cohorts that participated here. Um, we looked at asymmetry, um, white matter, um, things like brain aging. Um, so really the more kind of, I call it basic kind of comparisons. We also had a look at specific um, uh, clinical kind of correlates like childhood adversity, um, as well as suicidality and um, obesity. Um, and also looking into, this is a, a recent paper, uh, looking at underlying mechanisms of, of the different psychiatric, uh, of the different um, cortical thickness findings. So virtual histology approach. And I won't go into detail of all the findings, um, but I think, to highlight, there's, there's a few things to highlight. We, we recently published um, um, an invited review paper just summarizing all the, all the different findings. But again, like what we see in some of the other ones, um, other examples that I, that I showed in the ABCD and, and UK Biobank, that overall, that many of the structural brain alterations that we identified in Enigma MDD have much smaller effect sizes than had been previously assumed based on published studies um, and even in you know subsamples if we took more homogeneous uh, clinical subsamples the effect sizes were still quite limited so i think um, it's important to kind of um, realize that similar to the genetics literature it appears that individual measures of structural brain alterations account only for a limited amount of variance in complex phenotypes such as depression um, so that's one of the, I think, important messages of our work. The other thing is that we did find, as you can see here, 
some very interesting um, differences between kind of adolescent or adolescent onset MDD versus adult onset of old or older age, um, in which we basically found that um, the adolescent or adolescent onset MDD was associated specifically with lower hippocampal and lower uh, volumes and, and, um, and amygdala volumes, as well as cortical surface area differences, whereas cortical thickness show much more of an effect in adult onset and increases with age, um, as well as the, the, the white matter findings as well. So for me, these studies are almost more hypothesis generating. So I think um, it's not to say that they solve all the issues that we have and, and, and we all have the def definitive answers, but I think they, they um, are very good to um, generate new hypotheses, which could then be tested in smaller samples, for example, um, uh, with an experimental manipulation or a longitudinal component to it. Um, yeah, so we have a lot of ongoing projects. I won't go into detail here, but as I said, everyone can um, kind of propose a project. Uh, so there's a lot of new topics. So we're looking more at um, now the heterogeneity of depression. So going a bit beyond those co case control differences. Um, looking at specific phenotypes, different uh, imaging measures. Um, and I just wanted to, um, yeah, maybe maybe stop here after this. Just, just to say that there's a lot of considerations with consortia like this, that of course you have to build a database, but there's a lot of restrictions in terms of ethics approvals, privacy laws, um, a uh, level of data sharing that people feel um, comfortable with. Um, privacy laws are, are changing as well, which we have seen with GDPR, which makes it even harder and harder for people to share data, especially older data um, that don't have, you know, in their informed consent, maybe the, the different um, or the, the approvals for data sharing. Um, you need to think about authorships and data sharing policies, which we have worked a lot on in the last few years. Um, but there's a lot of things to think about. Um, I'll just skip this, just mentioning that we're also working on functional MRI at the moment to include that. We're developing protocols for that. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's not just, it's not a solution to everything. There are definitely uh, challenges in, um, with large scale consortia. But having said that, um, of course, we know all the challenges with privacy laws, ethics, no harmonization in, in neuroimaging and clinical data collection, which also limits the type of research questions that we can actually answer. But having said that, it's, it's, it is truly amazing to be working with so many people across the world uh, who all have a similar interest, who, who are all happy to share data um, just because of this kind of bigger cost, and, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, we recently got funding, or recently, about uh, one and a half years ago, uh, from NIH to set up another Enigma working group, uh, uh, the first transdiagnostic one on suicidal thoughts and behaviors, um, but we don't have any results on that yet. Um, but just to think, you know, everyone in my team involves, like many people in my team um, support this and, and work on projects within Enigma MDD. Um, and of course, I'm very, very grateful to all the people involved in Enigma MDD who share all the data and um, are just very active and, and do a lot of work with not always very obvious um, payoffs immediately. So um, I'm very grateful to all of them. And that was it. Thanks very much, Liana. It's uh, certainly an impressive scale of work and uh, I can imagine the challenges. I invite people to, to post questions. We've got time for one or two questions. I invite, them, I invite you to type questions in, in the Q&A box. Um, I might just ask, <laughs> What would you say is the biggest challenge in working so, with such a large group across mm. so many different countries? Well, 
I mean, there's, there's a few challenges, right? So one challenge is, of course, working with existing data that, like I said, it's, it's really a challenge to have all the different neuroimaging scanners, sequences, how to harmonize that, site effects, scanner effects. That's really difficult. With depression, there's, there's like 20 different skills used to, to measure depressive symptoms. How do you harmonize that? So that's a big challenge. And the other challenge, of course, is uh, more on a relational kind of level. How do you keep everyone happy? How do you keep everyone motivated? How um, do you resolve conflicts? Um, we've, I think we've been very lucky that in Enigma MDD, we haven't had any major conflicts and, and, and we have a group of um, very like-minded people and, and um, not very big egos, but that's of course, you know, a challenge to deal with as well. Well, it's uh, fabulous work and a very impressive scale. Uh, so thanks very much for sharing your experience and we'll come back and uh, circle back to, to have a bit of a discussion at the end of the session. Um, so next up, uh, I'd like, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Carla Miller from Oxford University. Uh, Carla is co-director of the physics group at the Wellcome Center for in, uh, Integrative Neuroscience. And she helped establish the imaging protocol for the UK Biobank, which is uh, currently the largest imaging study uh, in the world. And she's taken some really, uh, done some really groundbreaking work in trying to make sense of this immense data set. So thanks very much for uh, tuning in, Carla, and uh, look forward to hearing your perspective on the Biobank. Great, thanks very much for having me. Um, it's, uh, it's lovely to be joining you from uh, the opposite side of the world with a nice big cup of coffee. Um, so yes, I'm gonna be telling you about um, brain imaging in, in the UK Biobank. Um, you've heard a little bit about this study already. Um, uh, let me give you the, the just, just briefly tell you a bit about um, uh, the, the, the background of the study, so before imaging became a part of it. The UK Biobank is um, one of the largest um, uh, epidemiological cohorts in the world, so it's 500,000 individuals, a very similar age range um, uh, in the original baseline to um, uh, the PISA study that, that Mike was, Michael was telling us about. Um, so they are drawn from across the UK, um, and in this initial baseline visit um, to establish the cohort, uh, the, the, there, there are sort of three key features, I think, that are worth highlighting. The first is that they aimed to just extremely extensively characterize these individuals. Um, so uh, these are people basically um, recruited via their, um, uh, their GP, via the National Health Service in the UK. Um, so they're, they're, they've um, in the baseline visit, the main um, uh, aim was just to extensively phenotype these, these individuals. The second really important feature um, is that we have long-term access to their health records via the NHS. And this is one of the um, reasons why um, the UK felt this was a study that they might um, almost uniquely be able to, to do is by virtue of the fact that all these individuals are within a single health service. And importantly, and this is, I think, a key feature um, that distinguishes this study, for example, from, um, let's say, the PISA study, is that it's, it's entirely prospective. So there's no primary disease of focus. Um, the, the, the sort of um, the concept of this study is that if you really work at the population level, getting to, for example, half a million individuals in the original study, um, that purely by virtue of the numbers, you will... Um, you will phenotype people who go on to get um, the entire range of diseases that, in particular, this um, this age uh, um, this this age bracket uh, will go on to develop over the coming years. So the, the the aim of the study then is reliable assessment of many causes of many diseases. Um, so what they're trying to scoop up then is a, is a wide range of, of risk factors um, uh, factors relating to the environment to lifestyle and genetics. Um, and, and this is really the aim of this, this extensive phenotyping and genotyping. And in particular, one of the things that working at this scale enables you to do is you can start to look for quite complex interactions. Um, so the, I think it's really worth emphasizing that the participants are characterized largely prior 
to health outcomes. So they're largely healthy um, when they uh, are, are coming into the center. Obviously, there will be high incidence of some diseases such as um, uh, diabetes, but for many of the diseases um, of uh, late middle age to, to early old age, um, these individuals are still healthy. So the health outcomes are, are sort of still to come. Uh, so the point at which um, imaging enters into this then uh, was uh, about um, maybe five to eight years after um, the original baseline study. Uh, they obtained funding, uh, we obtained funding in order to bring back 100,000 of those subjects for imaging. So uh, as you can see on the right, um, it is a multi-organ study. I'm only going to be talking about the brain imaging today, but there's also body imaging, heart imaging, carotid ultrasound, uh, and DEXA bone scans. Again, the subjects are largely scanned prior to major health outcomes. Uh, so they're still relatively young, um, and most of them, almost by definition, if they end up coming into the center, uh, they are largely healthy. Um, as a prospective study, again, there is no disease of focus, so we're casting a very broad net. Um, and in particular, one thing that is, uh, I, I won't really mention more, but um, which we can come back to if people are interested, is that there is the opportunity, because it's a multi-organ study, to look at things such as uh, interactions between different organ systems uh, and how that relates to disease. So the idea, of course, then is um, uh, to take both imaging phenotypes as well as all the other information that already exists on these individuals relating to environment and lifestyle, uh, blood chemistry, genetics, um, and to learn um, how these relate to long health ter term outcomes in the biobank participants and then um, be able to predict the, the same long-term health outcomes in healthy individuals who were not a part of the original biobank study. So how do you go about scanning 100,000 subjects? I, th I think an important um, point to make here is that a study of, of this precise nature really had not been attempted before. Um, so we're not um, taking the Enigma approach of um, uh, a qu you know, compiling data that's been gathered um, from many different existing studies, we are bringing these subjects into a new scanning um, uh, study uh, where we have four dedicated centers. All they do is this study. So scanners were purchased purely for this study. Each of those centers that they can get through 54 subjects per day across um, uh, the four of them. If you do that seven days a week over five years, just multiply the numbers up and you reach 100,000. Um, so that then imposes constraints on what you can do. So in terms of the, the brain imaging, um, uh, it means that because we have a 3T scanner that just does the brain protocol, um, you, can, you can scan for 35 minutes on each of those subjects. And so individuals go through, um, they are sort of, you have um, triplets of, of subjects coming in and going through the, these, these different scanning um, uh, stations in parallel. And so you have 35 minutes for, for each of these sets of, of imaging. Um, and if you do that, then you can achieve the throughput that you need. Um, so throughput was really the, 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 key, um, uh, the, the, the key challenge um, alongside incidental findings that the, the funding bodies saw. And so actually, um, in order to convince uh, the funding bodies that this was actually feasible, uh, we had a pilot uh, center um, uh, in, a, in a town called Stockport near Manchester in the UK. Um, that came online in mid-2014. So purely to, to, to establish feasibility, we had to purchase scanners and build a, a, an entire building. Um, at that point, once we had um, demonstrated that we could, um, the first 5,000 subjects that we really could achieve this throughput, um, we then were um, uh, allowed to sort of continue with the full study and bring these further centers online. In the latest release, we've, we've, we've now released about 40,000 subjects. Um, just before COVID hit, uh, we were just hovering underneath um, 50k, uh, and that's where we are today with the imaging centers not yet up and running again. But so we've now released 40,000 subjects, um, uh, making it in terms of a, a study with this homogeneity, with all the centers having precisely the same hardware, um, it is the largest study, um, uh, imaging study that ever has been conducted. Um, so this just gives you an idea of the scale of what we're talking about. This is, this is the, uh, the, the, the pilot center. All of the other centers, I believe, have almost precisely the same layout. And in terms of achieving this throughput, um, one of the things that has been absolutely critical is that uh, there's an entire team that just thinks through exactly how you design a center such that people can um, uh, walk in the door 
and um, between four and five hours later walk out having been through a whole series of different um, uh, scanning stations, also having done um, some, some tests on the day uh, at these touch screens. Um, and so it really is a remarkable, a, a remarkable group effort of a number of people thinking hard about all various aspects of this. In terms of the brain imaging then, um, uh, we have, we acquire, um, it's, it's actually quite a similar range of um, modalities, scanning modalities uh, to what um, Michael was describing for the PISA study. And uh, we have uh, uh, T1 weighted structurals, T2 um, flare structurals, diffusion, um, task and resting fMRI, susceptibility weighted scans. Um, uh, and I'll just briefly um, show you what the protocol looks like. Uh, so what you can see here is, is essentially a, a, a very um, carefully thought through exercise in compromise, if I, if I can put it that way. Um, with 35 minutes, it is very tricky to get all of those imaging modalities uh, into um, the study. But um, because as, you, as you're working at these very large numbers, actually, in a sense, it's really the intersubject variability um, uh, that is important rather than the intrasubject variability. And so for many of these uh, imaging modalities, um, going for much shorter scans than you might typically acquire uh, in a, in a, um, a smaller um, scale study is, is actually um, an entirely acceptable compromise. Remember that what we're doing here is we're, we're trying to cast a really broad net in terms of um, the kinds of disease uh, that we want to capture. And so we needed to, to basically get, uh, we aimed for as multimodal as we could get within that 35 minute slot. One thing that was really um, crucial, um, so if we, um, uh, um, if we look at the, the sort of time scales that we have here for resting state and, and diffusion in particular, you can see that it's actually quite um, a, tight, a tight time window that we're, we're working to. And so one thing that was really crucial, um, this, this study came um, uh, fast on the heels of the Human Connectome Project, where uh, we had major gains in uh, simultaneous multi-slice or multi-band imaging. Uh, and so uh, we were able to take advantage of that technology, which at that point was really quite new. Um, so here you can see, for example, in the resting fMRI and the task fMRI, um, we were able to achieve um, very short TRs, which enables us to get a, a dense temporal sampling, uh, which is very helpful for um, uh, the, the degrees of freedom in the fMRI analyses. And in diffusion, uh, again, we were able to take advantage of that same simultaneous multi-slice or multi-band imaging, which enabled us in just seven minutes to actually acquire multi-shell data. Um, and I'll, I'll remind you in a moment uh, about the implications of that. But this was, this was really critical to be able to take advantage of this new technology. Um, one of the things that we were very um, keen on early on, which was actually interestingly a, 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 a little bit of a, um, a, a process of, of, um, uh, of lobbying the biobank to let us do this, um, was to develop a, an, an analysis pipeline. Initially, um, I think a lot of the epidemiologists in the study thought well, you take this kind of data, you chuck it into a database and people use it. But epidemiologists can't use that data as, as you as imaging experts know. Um, the raw data in and of itself uh, isn't intrinsically something you can just pick up and work with if you're not an expert. So um, uh, Steve Smith's group, um, in particular Fidel Alfaro Almagro, um, had developed a, <clears throat> a highly multimodal imaging um, uh, image processing pipeline based on the FSL tools that they can use not just to pre-process the data. So in the database, uh, you can have access to um, both the raw and the processed images, but also <clears throat> to produce what we call imaging derived phenotypes or IDPs. And I'll, I'll tell you what those are in a moment. But one thing you can do if you're curious about um, uh, the extent of these IDPs is you can go onto what's called the Biobank Showcase <clears throat> and you can just <clears throat> browse these IDPs in this, this browser that I'm showing here. And so the idea here was very much to try to <clears throat> provide phenotypes that non-imaging experts, epidemiologists, can immediately pick up and work with so they don't have to become imaging experts. And we can come back a bit later as to the, the sort of ups and downsides of, of that. To give you a feel for what kind of phenotypes, it's exactly the sort of thing that as imaging experts you would expect. So we calculate things like gray matter volumes um, uh, from the, the T1 structural, from the T2 flare. Uh, we have um, automated tools for developing white, mat white matter lesion volumes from the T2 star and soon to be um, uh, uh, um, uh, released in the next year or so. We also have quantitative susceptibility mapping um, predominantly in, in, in subcortical structures. So these are the sort of brain structure measures. 
um, in terms of brain function from the functional MRI data. Um, the main um, IDPs that we have at this point are um, amplitude of activity, both in the resting state and in the uh, task fMRI, as well as estimates of, of functional connectivity. Finally, from the diffusion imaging data, there's two types of um, uh, imaging derived phenotypes or IDPs that we can generate. Um, those relating to structural connectivity based on tractography, so the white matter tracks. And then because we have two shells of data, and, and again, this was something that was very critically enabled by the use of multiband, we can start to calculate microstructural properties. So using, um, in particular at the moment, we're using uh, NADI modeling, for those of you who are familiar with that, <clears throat> in order to try to come up with something that is more sensitive to microstructural features. So I was asked to talk a little bit about data access. <clears throat> um, Biobank is an entirely open study. It is open for researchers worldwide, including in academia and in industry. There is an application process. Um, this is partly to ensure that um, uh, when, um, uh, when granted access to the data, that uh, certain uh, protection of, of, of sub sensitive um, subject data is ensured. The fact that when um, subjects are um, there, basically they can opt out of the study uh, at any point if they want, in which point um, uh, researchers have to be um, have to agree to have you know, to remove those subjects data. There is a modest um, data access fee um, and that is basically to maintain this as a resource. So the idea is that um, this resource is going to be um, maintained for the very long term and, and obviously that's important for this concept of being able to accumulate health uh, outcomes uh, over the, the, the coming decades. Uh, one thing that's worth emphasizing is that uh, they, they take this very seriously um, uh, in, in, in Biobank, the, the openness of the data set, to the extent that as, um, as people who are helping to run the UK Biobank, who helped to set up um, the acquisition um, protocol, as well as uh, the, the, um, the pipeline that, that processes the data, uh, we are not given any preferential access. So um, to the extent that we, we have ourselves, we have to have um, a... Uh, um, an application uh, uh, that is approved in order to access the data. And we're not allowed to do anything with the data uh, prior to release. So we don't even get a, an, an early period of, of sort of preferential access. Um, so I'd like to just walk you uh, through in the, the last bit here, uh, a few of the things that we've done with the data. Um, the, the first type of, of um, uh, when, we, when the, the data first became available, um, one of the studies that we published was sort of aiming to demonstrate the power of numbers that you can get from Biobank, and in particular, what you can do when you have data like this where um, it's extremely homogeneous. So again, um, all of the subjects at this point went through the same single scanner. So this is from the pilot um, uh, site. Uh, and here what we did was we took um, the first 5,000 subjects and the 2,500 imaging phenotypes that at that point that we were generating. And we simply did a large scale association study against non-imaging phenotypes. So with 2.8 million association tests in these 5,000 subjects um, using a, um, an FDR level of multiple comparison correction, uh, we, were, we identified 30,000 significant associations. And you can see that um, these associations are across a pretty wide range of imaging phenotypes. So on the, um, the x-axis, uh, you see the you know, large scale categorization of the different types of phenotypes. Um, in this Manhattan plot, uh, the y-axis is negative log 10p. So you can see that the, um, the, effect si uh, the, the significance of, the, of these effects is, is, is in many cases massive. Um, and the other thing that you can see is the, the, um, the value of having such a multimodal data set. It's not one modality that's dominating here, uh, but most of the different uh, modalities that we acquired throw up some, some associations uh, across uh, these different phenotypes. That was the first 5,000 subjects going to um, uh, the um, current release of about 40,000 um, uh, subjects. You can see that this now rises to 453,000 significant associations. So there's an awful lot um, going on here that, that you can detect. Um, Biobank also has uh, genetics that was released in, in 2018, um, and this was the, the first uh, um, paper showing imaging genetics from the UK Biobank. I'm not going to go through many of these results, but this is one example um, where uh, we performed imaging GWAS with all of the, um, uh, the IDPs that were available. This is just one, uh, which is the T2 star. 
in the putamen. Um, and here what you can see is uh, that this particular um, uh, imaging phenotype uh, generated a large number of, of hits um, across the genome. Um, what you can do uh, that's quite interesting then, so this is of course a discovery um, of, of hits associated with T2 star in the putamen, you can then take these individual SNPs and you can regress them back into the raw imaging data at the voxel-wise level. And if you do that, what emerges is quite interesting, um, which is that each of these SNPs has associated with it a, a different spatial pattern. So we identified all these SNPs because they were associated with T2 star uh, on average across the entire putamen. But when you do this regression, what you find is essentially a segmentation of the putamen um, that is unique for each of these individual SNPs. Um, in terms of trying to understand what this might tell us, I can just give you this one example, um, this, this hit in chromosome 3 uh, that you're seeing on the far left uh, relates to genes for iron transport and storage. And that's particularly interesting um, for this imaging marker, T2 star, which, uh, as Michael mentioned earlier, is an imaging marker for tissue iron. So it, 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 it feels like that is a, you know, quite an interesting and story that is pointing toward um, uh, you know, what, this, what this hit might be telling us. Um, in terms of the biological source of it. Another thing that we've been uh, starting to look at recently in um, uh, uh, the UK Biobank data um, is starting to do some more um, uh, data-driven analyses um, that are, in, in a sense, less on the discovery side and more in terms of trying to think through um, the kinds of uh, um, uh, uh, um, mechanistic um, data-driven phenotypes that you can come up with. So one that many people have been interested in is, is, is brain age delta. So the basic concept here is if we um, take imaging phenotypes uh, and we look at their relationship to age, uh, we can basically try to form an, a, an age prediction based on these imaging phenotypes. Uh, and then if we look at how an individual varies from uh, uh, that their predicted age, so how their true age and their, um, their predicted age differ, that gives us um, what we might call the brain age delta. And the idea is that that brain age delta gives us uh, something of, of a measure of that individual's health. So um, the idea would be that if you have a positive delta, that indicates that your, your, your brain is aging faster than the population norm. Similarly, if you have a negative delta, it's sort of decelerated aging. Uh, so one of the things that we wanted to do with, um, uh, with the biobank was to move beyond this kind of a single brain age and ask, well, can you actually predict multiple modes of brain aging? There's no reason to assume that an individual has a single well-defined brain age. Different aspects of brain health um, could be reflecting um, uh, very different uh, deltas, brain, brain age deltas in the same subject. Uh, so what we did with this, which really required the large number of subjects that we have in biobank, um, we wanted to identify multiple modes of brain aging, so um, uh, essentially multiple ways of, of stratifying different individual subjects. So here what we did was a, an ICA, it's actually an ICA and CCA analysis, um, uh, where um, we um, de um, identified multiple modes uh, of brain aging by, you know, in a purely data-driven way, um, run ICA uh, to, um, to identify uh, a number of different modes um, and then look to see which of those have some uh, association with age. And as you can see in the, um, the plot on the bottom right here, most of the modes that we identified, again, in a purely data-driven way, did have some association with age. And so what we can do then is to, to look at these different um, aspects of aging to see whether they seem to be associated, these, these different modes are associated with different aspects of brain health. And I don't have time to really go into this much, but one of the things that's quite interesting that we found was when we took these, um, the, an individual's delta according to each individual mode, so again, each subject now has multiple deltas, brain age deltas, we can then use that to um, perform brain age delta GWAS. So take their delta from each individual mode and use that to do a genetic association study. And what we found that was quite interesting was that when we um, did those GWAS using the, uh, the, the multiple modes on the top, we identified many genetic associations. By comparison, if we generate just a single best delta, um, so essentially you can think of it as combining to get an even better brain age prediction across all of these modes, what you find is that these genetic associations go away. 
And so that suggests that what's happening here is that although your, 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 brain, your, your age prediction is better, what you're actually doing is diluting out a number of interesting um, biological effects that exist when you have these multiple modes. Again, it's somewhat supportive of the idea that we're seeing multiple ways of, of, of you know, different ways in which an individual's brain can age. Finally, um, a study that is quite um, uh, dear to my heart, which is much more in the, uh, along the lines of, of basic neuroscience, um, uh, we used this, the, the diffusion and, and functional data to ask, does brain microstructure predict function? This is something that you know, we know from many animal studies that there should be a relationship between these two. So uh, white matter pathways should relate to um, the function between brain regions that they subserve. But there's actually been very little um, along these lines shown in um, <clears throat> in in, um, uh, uh, in 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 human imaging data. And so here, what we did was to um, basically to, to ask precisely this question: If we take the white matter pathway or microstructural features from the, uh, the white matter pathway that connects a given pair of brain regions, can we predict the the strength of functional coupling between them? And as you see here on the bottom. Um, we were able to predict sometime as much as, as you know, over 10% of the total variance in uh, the total cross subject variance in functional connectivity. Uh, but importantly, when we um, then um, repeated that prediction in about 4,000 unseen subjects, you can see that this was highly reproducible. And again, we can take these relationships, so specifically the microstructure function relationship, um, and we can use that to perform uh, it, uh, an imaging GWAS. Um, and here, what we found were uh, genes relating to the wind signaling pathway, which relates to axonal growth and guidance. And so again, um, that, that, that seems like a very um, uh, a, a, a clear interpretation of, of what these results are telling us. Uh, so I'll just conclude by telling you um, about a few recent developments that have been coming up in the UK Biobank. Um, there's a second imaging time point um, that is currently underway for 10,000, uh, and we're fairly bullish that we're actually going to be able to bring back um, as many, hopefully as many subjects as are willing to come in for a second uh, uh, imaging time point. So uh, hopefully that, that 10,000 will turn into something more like 50 or 60,000. Uh, currently underway, exome and full genome sequencing. Um, uh, so at the moment, we're dealing with imputed data, um, but uh, full sequencing is on its way. And um, recently, uh, Steve Smith's group has released a brain imaging GWAS in uh, the, the current release of 40,000, um, which, sorry, this should say, including the X chromosome. Uh, and you can explore that here at, at, at this um, resource. Uh, so to conclude, um, population neuroimaging, um, many opportunities, so early markers of many diseases, interactions between uh, organ systems, discovery of associations, generation of new hypotheses. These are all wonderful opportunities. Uh, but as we've touched on in various ways, there are challenges. So we are detecting very small effects, um, and that is something that, you know, is, is, is something for us to discuss. How do, what do we do with many, many small effects? Um, Big data demands new methods. So for example, the, um, uh, the ICA analyses I was showing you earlier. Um, tiny confounds matter. I didn't have time to talk about this, but we can detect extremely subtle effects um, that we can be fairly sure are confounds, uh, which also suggests to us that there are many other confounds that we maybe are less sure about, but which we probably do need to be worrying about. And finally, uh, the power in Biobank really requires us to be able to harmonize with other data sets so that we can use the Biobank to learn effects uh, that we can then roll out uh, in new data um, in order to predict health outcomes. So with that, um, I would just like to thank all the uh, many, many individuals who are involved in the study. Obviously, I'm not going to go through these in great detail. Um, uh, and I'll just thank you uh, for your attention. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Carla. Uh, certainly mind-boggling numbers, uh, but uh, amazing work and incredible resource. Uh, so we've got time for one quick question. Some are already posting on the chat, but maybe we can circle back to them at the end. Um, I'll just ask one. Uh, it's an access question. So uh, I'm curious about the process of setting up a study that has NHS or equivalent access embedded within it. Who facilitates this access and how is the data collected? Right. So, setting up a study with has NHS or equivalent access embedded within it. Um, so the, I mean, access to the access to long-term health records is entirely um, uh, coordinated by the UK Biobank themselves. So that data um, comes 
is, is basically released um, uh, via the UK Biobank team. I don't know if, if the question relates to whether you can get access to um, uh, information that is not by default included in, in, in that Biobank data. I'm not I'm not sure whether that is possible. So I'm not sure, for example, whether you can actually sort of request bespoke um, information. I don't know. It, it can be. Sorry, yeah. Steve Smith is sitting next to me. We're married. <laughs> uh, he says he says that you can you can you can it, have access it, you to can it. Can apply for that kind of. Thing. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's it, it's not something that I've done before, but apparently that is possible. Yeah. Wonder. Alex, can I jump in with a question? Be really cheeky. Quickly. <laughs> um, just a quick question about the demographics of your population. Um, what do you sort of control for um, and is something like ethnicity within that range because I see scope for like personalization almost of this data. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is, this is something that I, I find a bit heartbreaking. Um, so it, it, the, it is the, the, the population is not very ethnically diverse to be completely frank. So the, the, the way that recruitment is done, it's done um, purely based on, you know, identifying people who are within a catchment area. So they need to be close enough to one of the centers. In this case, there's only four centers um, across the UK. They are in um, urban regions. Um, uh, and then they just recruit people via their, um, their, their GP. And so you're very, it's, you bait, you're very, um, subject to who uh, lives in those areas and who is willing to participate. And mm. to be completely honest, there's an ethnic bias in terms of whether people agree to participate in the study or not. Um, mm. And it's, it's a problem. Um, there are other studies um, that are being pursued um, in other regions. So for example, there are related studies happening now in China and a few other areas. And we are keeping, you know, trying where possible to, to at least discuss how we can harmonize with those studies, mm. because it is, a big, big problem, I think. Yeah, it's a short Thanks. one. Yeah. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, I'm just conscious of, of trying to finish on time. So we might move on to our next speakers. And then I would encourage you to post questions. And uh, perhaps the speakers can sort of type answers as, as we go along, or we can save them for, for the end if we have a bit of time for discussion. Uh, so next up, we have two presentations that are designed to provide an EMCR perspective on, on dealing with large data sets. And we've got uh, two speakers that have really been able to turn these data into some fantastic outputs with uh, important implications for understanding the brain. Uh, so first up, we have Dr. Ye Tian, who recently completed her PhD uh, in the Department of Psychiatry at University of Melbourne, is currently working as a postdoctoral fellow there. Uh, and she's done some wonderful work leveraging public data sets like the HCP. So uh, over to you, Ye. Thank you. Um, so I can't share my screen. Thank you, Alex. Oh, uh, Carla, could you uh, share your screen? Okay, thank you. Um, give me a second. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay, um, so first of all, thank you. And thanks everyone. I'm very thrilled to be part of this. Uh, panel. So I'm going to talk about the challenges actually made when I use those large open neural imaging datasets to study the brain organization in health and also diseases. So I will going to talk about uh, the challenges in the context of the three studies that listed here with the using of HCP dataset as well as the Philadelphia neurodevelop neurodevelopmental cohort. So in the first study, we mapped the topographic organization of the human subcortex using the resting state function fMRI data from the Human Connector project of over a thousand healthy individuals. So we developed this technique called gradient topography to, to map the trajectory of uh, functional connectivity gradients across the topography of the subcortex. So here the figure showed the string line. The string lines were propagated in a similar way as white matter tractography typically performed in diffusion imaging. But here the tractography is proposed uh, is propagated by, based on the functional connectivity gradient, so we call that gradient topography. So this approach allows, uh, allows us to perform model selection to reconcile the two concepts. One is the smooth gradient and the hard boundary. And we then, with the model selection, in the end, we're dealing with the multi-scale subcortical atlas um, I, that organized across the four scales. Here I show the scale one and the scale four postulations. We also replicated this postulation using 17 fMRI data set, uh, also provided by the HCP, and we use the task fMRI data to, and we find the, the reconfiguration in terms of the functional boundary change in response to those cognitive demands. 
And we also personalize this atlas to take into account individual variation in the function architecture. And finally, with the use of the new subcortical atlas, we will be able to investigate the functional, uh, the relationship between subcortical functional connectivity and the individual variation in the behaviors. So none of the uh, studies will be possible without the provision of HCP dataset, which is uh, which I very, really appreciate. And they have the multiple neural imaging modalities. They have the highest neural imaging data quality to date. They're all pre-processed. We can just freely, uh, they're all freely available to download. So which is the very good part of HCP. But however, here is the challenges I made, particularly when I studied the subcortex. So one big challenge is the HCP protocol, which is a single echo um, API sequence. So the, uh, and the echo term is actually uh, optimized for the cerebral cortex. And, but the subcortical regions, subcortical nuclei, the effective relaxation time of to star are actually much shorter com compared to the cortex because of the iron enrichment. So this yielded overall low SNR in the subcortex, but also other limitations in current I imaging techniques is because of deep location of the subcortex, it's at large distance from the head core, and it's close uh, it's very close to the ventricle, which means it has, it has more physico physiological noise. And also because of a limited spatial resolution, even as good as HCP, we would not be able to map the function architecture with very small subcortical nuclei. So in this study, we, we successfully mapped the function architecture with, uh, of several major subcortical area, but hopefully in the future with the optimized 70 acquisition protocol with multi-echo planar imaging and even higher spatial resolution, we would be able to understand the function architecture of those uh, very small subcortical nuclei as I just listed here. And the second study I want to talk about is, uh, so we want to understand whether the connectivity biomarkers of human cognition are reliable. So studying the brain behavior relationship has been always uh, exciting, attractive and popular. It has become even more popular with, nowadays with the use of machine learning approach. Uh, so indeed, so studies have shown that uh, show evidence that a trained machine learning model can be used to predict cognitive performance of some novel individuals based on their brain scan, like functional connectivity, with a reasonable um, prediction accuracy. However, we, I, I want to mention that predicting the IQ or cognition of a healthy adult is not really crucial in real life. So the more important goal of machine learning in this context is to facilitate the understanding of the of the underlying mechanism that gave rise to the individual variation in the cognition. So which means that it's really important to investigate those features. And here are two commonly uh, used ways to understand those predictive features. So the first one is to just average the, those uh, beta coefficients across, for example, the tenfold cross-validation iterations. Alternatively, uh, so I'm um, sorry, so the first one did not consider the variation across the samples. So the second approach is to select those consensus features that appear in all the iterations as I show on the right side. However, as you can see here, many of the individuals uh, are overlapped across those iterations, which means they are not um, uh, independent. So we don't really know whether those predictive features, they are reliable or actually generalizable to the population because they're always in the sample. So, in, so where instead we design a half-split approach to, to train the model on independent samples and then compare the two estimated feature weights. So this gave us um, an out-of-sample estimation of those feature consistency as opposed to the within sample consistency, the estimation as impl implemented in most of the, uh, in most previous studies. And here is what we find. So first of all, so for sure, so we can, um, get uh, a reasonable out of sample prediction accuracy of a correlation coefficient like 0 0.3, 0 0.4. But if we, uh, so let's look at the uh, consistency in those features. Here is the weighting sample consistency as most um, commonly implicated in the previous studies. And here is the out of sample consistency and is what should be done. We show that reliability is indeed inflated if we investigate those features in the uh, in the manner of within sample. So what does this mean? 
Um, does this mean that cognitive, uh, the, the connectivity biomarkers of human cognition are not reliable? Or it might suggest a diffused pattern of functional connectome that gave rise to human cognition. And then it will be, uh, so it will be interesting to look at task fMRI data. So potentially because of the actual engagement of, of the cognitive process during the task evoked fMRI. So those connectivity biomarkers might be more reliable or uh, it might be more informative if we study a clinical population with, clin uh, with cognitive deficits because of, the because of the expected correspondence between brain pathology and those cognitive dysfunction. So here, as I said, without HCP, uh, we can, so it has a large sample size. Uh, so that's why we can split the samples into different training and testing folds to, to test the reproducibility. It also has multiple modalities. So maybe the next step, we need to look at task fMRI data. But here's the challenges, as I mentioned, they are healthy individuals. So those conclusions we can draw between the behavior traits and the brain measures are limited. And this, the effect size is normally very small at individual edge level. And because it's health population, we cannot really inform clinical population pathology or the brain changes in response to any uh, interventions or clinical treatment uh, as, as to, such as the cognitive training. And finally, in this, uh, finally, so the third study I will, uh, is to investigate the brain uh, development um, and its association with psychopathology uh, using the Philadelphia neurodevelopmental cohort. So in this study, we uh, extracted structure properties of the brain using T1 weighted images. So we then we trained a machine model, uh, we trained a machine learning model, and to um, and based on, and to predict the the age uh, to predict the brain age based on based on those uh, structure measures, and the difference between the predicted brain age and the chronological age of that individual is referred to as the brain age gap to indicate the altered morphological development. We were interested to see whether um, the individual variation in the brain age gap is associated with the seven psychopathology dimensions. And here's what we find here I show is the, yeah, so there, there are associations. Here I show is the regional pattern that contribute the most to the association between brain age gap and each of the psychopathology dimension, including the general uh, measure. And more interesting, we also find some shared regional patterns of brain pathology that across some of the psychopathology dimensions. I don't have to, time to go into detail, but please go to this paper if you are interested. And here is a small summary. The PNC dataset is great. Uh, it has a large sample size, so and it has very wide age range. So it allows us to investigate age-related brain changes. It is a community sample which uh, avoids the diagnosis biases in terms of the cutoff threshold. So we can study the psychopathology as a continuum. It also facilitated population inference. And a very good part of HC, uh, sorry, the PNC is that all the images were acquired using one scanner. So there's no side effect. However, we have to um, admit the, the challenges. So all the PNC images, they are unprocessed and the data quality is not as great as HCP dataset. We spend lots of time to doing systematic um, quality control as well as the visual inspection of all the images. And many of the kids or adolescents, they are either healthy or have some subclinical symptoms. So which means our conclusion, our uh, results normally have very small effect size. So don't really know the, how much the, we, we can refer can, in, can read from that. And it is PNC is a cross-sectional data set. So we have to be careful, even when we look at brain development, we have to be very careful about the conclusion in without the longitudinal data set. And here is the point I really want to um, raise is because many of the research group around the world are using the same data set. So the question comes as, shall we do the multiple comparison across all the previous studies using the same data set, like in investigate uh, some similar research questions. So in a big, in a broad summary of all the advantage and challenges I mentioned previously, here's a summary. So overall, um, 
of course, it's very, it's great. It has a great statistic power. Facilitate population inference. It uh, can facilitate or help with open science and reproducibility collaboration. It is also very ECR friendly. Like me, I won't be able to collect all the data during my PhD. But also need to. So here's the challenges we we have to face. So for because it's the standard imaging acquisition protocol. So the the protocol might not be optimized for the brain regions you are actually interested, such, such, such as subcortical area. And we cannot control the imaging quality. And some of the behavior or clinical assessment, those phenotype might not really be the one you are really interested. Some, some they don't have the one you needed. So which means we have relatively limited research questions to, to ask. And it's generally community sample, effect size small, no information, no limited information in terms of neuropathology. We don't know whether any brain changes in response to clinical treatment interventions. And as I mentioned, the issue with multiple comparison and also many majority of the, of the data sets, though the participants are mainly Caucasians. So it's not really as, um, ethnically representative globally. So those conclusions we have might not be uh, generalized to, to, to humans, to homo sapiens as a species. Us. So what, what should we do? How to keep the balance? So I think that we need both um, globally. We need the large community sample, but we also need to um, push, I mean, mean, encourage moderate sample size with specific hypotheses, deep phenotyping with specific clinical population and with involvement of the intervention, etc. And finally, <laughs> I would like to thank everyone, um, my, especially my supervisor, Andrew Zalaski, and all the collaborators have been involved in all the studies. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. And thanks to the com committee of OHBM chapter. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank thanks very much. Yeah, it was uh, some, some marvelous work there and a fantastic example of how to use open source data to do fabulous uh, stuff during a PhD. Uh, we're running a little bit behind schedule, so I'll ask people to type questions in the Q&A, and yeah, you're, you can answer them uh, in the Q&A, and then we can circle yep. back if we have time for discussion at the end. Um, last up today is uh, Dr. Max Schein, who's based at the University of Sydney, and Max has had uh, really tremendous success in using various public data resources uh, and today he's going to talk about his own experiences in, in, in dealing with these data. So thanks, Mac. Thanks, Alex. All right. All right, here we go. Can you see my screen there? Yep. Great. All right. So thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be part of such an awesome, vibrant community. So. Um, what I thought I'd talk a little bit about today um, is essentially the sort of journey that I've been on as a postdoc and the kind of coincidence that happened um, through my uh, finishing up my PhD and, and doing a postdoc really at the time when a lot of really amazing open data resources were coming along, coming online and, and were available. And the sort of shift that, that took place from my PhD where I did a lot of data collection towards my postdoc and now uh, running in my own lab where I'm trying to do a lot more work with open data and the kinds of resources that are openly available. Um, so the idea is, right, we, we all know just how complex the brain is when we look at it from a bird's eye view. On the left, you're seeing a, a beautiful picture of calcium transients from a, a translucent zebrafish. On the right-hand side, some data from the Allen Brain Institute showing the sort of dizzying complexity of the different cortical cell types within a single cortical column in a mouse brain. Um, and so because of this complexity, it's often sort of easy to either just zoom right down and look at one particular area and say, aha, this is my favorite brain region. All I care about is the amygdala or the hippocampus or the striatum, and how am I going to tie that to function? Or to really take the other perspective and sort of zoom back out and try to look at things from the systems level perspective. And the argument I want to make today that is that if you are really compelled by the systems level perspective and you, and you like the kinds of um, ideas and impressions you can get of the brain from that perspective, that open data is really set up to sort of perfectly sit in that little space between a theorist and an experimentalist and help you test systems level neuroscience hypotheses. 
So um, one perspective that we can take when we think from a systems level is to think of the brain uh, as a network. And so this uh, involves a few decisions you have to make. Um, the idea is if you can set up a, a number of regions, here are these are the circles in our diagram, and we'll call them nodes, and a number of relationships between those regions, we'll call them edges. And these can be anything you like. They can be um, the distinct uh, connection between two regions, say, with a diffusion weighted um, imaging analysis. They could be the statistical relationship in a functional connectivity analysis. They can be anything you'd like. As long as you think you can interpret the graph, that's the important part. And then we can wire them up and we can look, in, look at their shape or their topology from a bird's eye perspective and see if there's, there's changes that might be occurring in different contexts. Now, a couple of measures that we use to characterize uh, these networks um, are really uh, influential group, um, Gumer and Amaral came up with a really nice uh, profile, which is called the cartographic profile. And the idea is that you wire up the network like this. In this case, let's say it's a functional connectivity network. And then you characterize the topological signature of each node in the network using two different measures. The within module score, which essentially is gonna tell you how influential a particular region is within its own little cluster. And then a between module score, which is gonna tell you how uh, um, integrated the, this particular node is within the whole network or how distributed its connection profile is. And because it'll be relevant for some of the slides, um, one of the ideas is that we can plot this, those two measures in this little two-dimensional histogram. So you'd have the between module score along the x-axis and the within module score along the y-axis. And that is you can plot each of those regions like a little heat map inside that little cartographic profile and get a really simple uh, way of characterizing this otherwise sort of complex dizzying complexity of the, of the brain uh, network that you've characterized. And so um, the idea just to sort of hammer it home is that we've got a network over here on the right. Let's say that each of the green, the blue, the purple, the orange, the black modules are all sort of individual um, modules within a network. Maybe one's a visual, one's an auditory, one's a um, uh, you know, default mode or maybe an attentional network. The idea is that we're gonna try to identify the network nodes here in blue that are really integrative. The ones that are allowing the communication to occur between these different otherwise isolated um, uh, submodules. And the idea is that the more integration we have in the network, the more crosstalk, the more you could get from node A to B via different connections, the more that the network will shift its cartographic profile to the right hand side of this graph. It will become more integrated. All right, so with that little primer in mind, I sort of thought this would be a fun experience to kind of go back and try to sort of characterize a little bit of a mini timeline. Uh, of what I've done over the last few years and try to sort of put it into the context of how you could take this idea of network topology and test some of the ideas about its relationship to say intelligence or cognitive function uh, with open data resources. All right, so where did I come from? So I did a, a medical degree um, and it really is a lot like scrubs. Um, don't let anyone lie to you. Um, but um, at the end of my medical degree, I decided to do a PhD in Parkinson's disease worked really hard on Parkinson's, non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease in particular. And I was fortunate at the end of my degree to get a um, NHMRC fellowship, which took me overseas to the United States. I worked with Russell Poldrack at the University of Stanford. And on my first day, I sat down in Russ's office and said, I've got lots of cool ideas about brain networks and Parkinson's disease. And Russ essentially told me no. Um, that he wasn't particularly interested in uh, understanding Parkinson's disease in detail and that it wasn't really something that I ought to be doing. So I had to basically, on uh, the first day of my postdoc, find a way to pivot. Um, and one of the things that I think um, uh, really helps with open data is that it's easier to pivot now than it ever has been. You, haven't, you don't have to collect an entire data set over a course of years. You can tap into these really amazing resources that are available to ask questions of interest. So that's my first rule of open data science is that uh, open data helps you pivot. So um, the first really main project that I worked on with Russ involved taking data from the Human Connectome Project. Um, what we did was we took the data uh, from the uh, cognitively challenging NBAC task. We translated it into um, different dynamic networks using a dynamic connectivity method and then translated those into topological networks. And we essentially found that as uh, the tasks came online, as you were performing a cognitive task, your brain had a higher degree of integration. So you can see that on a little heat map on the bottom left here with the network shifting to the right I had to be in a more integrated state in a relatively distributed fashion during the task blocks and then shifting back towards the segregated state uh, in the rest blocks. Um, so the next thing that I did uh, work on another open data set was to use something that Russ had collected on himself, which is the My Connectome project. So basically, Russ uh, was really interested in individual differences and the stability of networks over time. 
So he put himself in the scanner a couple times a week over the course of a couple years and had a really rich, interesting data set where he basically had imaging data over the course of time on a single subject, along with a number of other phenotypic measures. And so what we did is we applied the same kind of analysis that we did in the first study to uh, Russ's resting state data, in this case, not in the task. And then we clustered that data and we essentially found that there were two really different kinds of states uh, over the course of time that really interdigitated with one another. Um, and that essentially they had different uh, signatures in topological space. So when he was in the blue meta state over time, he was more integrated. And when he was in the red meta state, he was more segregated. Um, and then we were actually able to relate that to some of his phenotypic measures and find that when he was in the blue state, he was more attentive and focused. And when he was in the red state, he was more distracted and, and sleepy. So the idea was that there might be these really interesting fluctuations in the way that we actually utilize our brains in this sort of network topological sense that fluctuates over time. That if we don't take account of these, we might be actually putting in apples and oranges into the same studies, uh, particularly if uh, the different um, clinical disorders, let's say, that we're characterizing have different um, baseline um, fluctuations in, in, let's say, distracted or focused performance. All right, so after my postdoc, I then was moving back to Australia and anyone that's had to do a large overseas move, um, particularly immediately after Trump got elected, will know that it's quite a distracting time and it's hard to get things rolling. So one of the other things that uh, I really spent a lot of my time on doing was actually doing a lot of reading and thinking about what could have caused these different um, uh, networks to form and, and dissolve as they do. And um, so uh, I, I really uh, read a lot of different papers, but really focused down a lot of my reading on the ascending arousal system. And it's actually become a really major interest for me going forward in thinking about how different neuromodulators like the noradrenaline from locus cerulis or acetylcholine from the basal nucleus and Maynard can come up and innovate and douse the brain in different neurochemicals that can change the information processing mode of the brain and change the functional topology. Um, and I just thought I'd do a quick um, a skip to the future um, because um, uh, my, one of my really talented postdocs, Brandon Munz, right now doing some really exciting modeling work using Ezekovich neurons that's actually been able to recreate some of the um, dynamic signatures and uh, information processing benefits of organizing a system with different uh, constraints, the way that the cholinergic and the noradrenergic system is organized. So I'd say my rule number two is that open data favors the pre prepared mind because Brandon's actually been using an open data set called NeuroTyco, which is an open um, murine uh, MEG data set to actually test some of the predictions of his model. And I don't think we would have been able to do any of that work if we hadn't have put the extra time into read and think about the particular hypotheses that could underpin some of the um, patterns we've seen in the fMRI data. All right, back to 2018. So one of the implications of the neuromodulatory uh, idea is that um, augmenting or altering neuromodulatory tone in the brain should change network topology. So um, a really uh, sort of a common way to do this is to use drugs that block the reuptake of different um, neurotransmitters. So in this case, the drug atomoxetine will block the reuptake of noradrenaline, which will then potentiate at the synapse. It'll then interact more with those G protein receptors, the little squiggly lines in red and blue, which will then go in and change the intrinsic excitability through different G protein cascades that will change calcium, open up voltage gated ion channels and change the receptiveness and excitability or the neural gain of the cell. Um, and so we had a prediction, which was that increasing noradrenaline should cause an in increase in, um, in integration. And during the resting state was the exact opposite of what, <laughs> what we were expecting. Um, and so uh, this was in a collaboration with uh, Sander Neuenhaus, who knows a lot about noradrenaline. And Sander said, well, um, it turns out that um, Gary S. And Jones, who's sort of the godfather of noradrenergic neuroscience, has actually shown that when you give animals atomoxetine or modafinil, which is a related drug, what it does is it actually potentiates noradrenaline at the synapse. But the locus cerulis, which is the major projector of noradrenaline to the rest of the brain, is exquisitely sensitive to that chemical. And it turns down tonic levels, but turns up phasic bursts. So a prediction would be that if you uh, gave people a task um, constraint on top of the atomoxetine, then you'd actually sh see a shift towards integration. And so quite fortunately, we, we looked around on the web and we found there was an, a single data set of people performing a, a cognitively challenging NVAC task with atomoxetine on board. We, we wrote to them, they shared the data, and lo and behold, we found wha what we were expecting, which is that under the certain context, you can actually recruit phasic bursts, we think, that augment, uh, that the noradrenaline augments that integrative uh, potential and causes the, sh the system to shift towards integration. So rule number three is, for every interesting research question, there exists a data set that can help you understand it better. 
All right, to 2019, I'm, I realized that I'm running a little uh, behind, so I'm just gonna quickly rip through some of this stuff. Um, we got really interested in the idea of trying to test uh, low dimensional signatures in brain imaging data, um, inspired by this work by Manuel Zimmer's group uh, in C. Elegans. And we again uh, turned to the Human Connectome Project and utilized the fact that there were seven distinct tasks that are performed in the same subjects. And when we applied PCA to that data, you can essentially, whoop, the video is not playing, so I just have to tell you what happens. There's a brain state uh, fluctuation over time uh, that recruits the uh, low dimensional signature of the brain within a, co a cognitive manifold that you can uh, pull into and out of different tasks that actually leverage um, the sort of uh, degrees of freedom within the system uh, to allow you to um, perform the task in a really simple manner. It doesn't, isn't anywhere near as complex as the, um, the n-dimensional brain that we start with. So, sorry about that not working. So, um, we were able to do a bunch of add-on tasks to that that showed that it was cognitively meaningful. Um, we used the Neurosynth database, again, another open resource um, to link um, the patterns that we saw to different meta-analyses of the brain. And we essentially found that movement in a low dimensional state space was related to meta-analyses from over 5,000 different imaging studies, which give you some confidence that this pattern that we were seeing wasn't idiosyncratic to the particular tasks, but was related to a sort of more fundamental organizing principle. Um, and we were also able to use the Allen Brain Atlas to link these um, patterns that we saw to the density of mRNA expression of different neuromodulatory receptors, suggesting that the brain could integrate when it pulled into certain receptors domains, but then segregate when it was loading onto different receptors. So rule number four is embrace multimodal data sources. Um, and then rule number five is reach out for help if you need it. Um, I couldn't have done any of this work that I've described today without help from numerous collaborators that come in and help to put um, legitimacy and, and really good methodological strength behind ideas that are actually using really complicated data sets. And I think it's really important um, to have like a really integrative community when we're starting to use these different data sources to answer our questions. All right, so I'm not going to go into too much in 2020 or to skip forward other than to say that there's lots and lots of really exciting, interesting questions that we're starting to answer that are using um, uh, different uh, open data sources. And it'll bring me to rule number six, which is that computational modeling and open data belong together. Um, computational modeling is a really exciting approach, but it often feels under constraint. And bringing it together with open data sources, particularly from different modalities, can start to sort of break down some of our implicit biases that we're using when we only look at the brain through one particular lens. So looking back at um, my timeline, I'm not entirely clear, uh, clear to myself how I got from being um, a medical student to where I am today, but I do know that I couldn't have done it without open data. Um, and so I'd like to do a shout out to all of the um, different resources that I used in constructing um, the work today. Um, and my rule number seven is be kind uh, in general, but also to, especially to the hardworking scientists that came before you and created these amazing resources that we can use uh, to ask these questions. Uh, and with that, I'd like to say thank you very much and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Mac. That was a wonderful example of uh, leveraging diverse types of open data to uh, undertake some really cool work. So I might invite all the speakers to, to come back and, and show their videos and uh, open up uh, a discussion. So I'll, I'll ask the attendees to um, uh, post questions in the chat or raise their hand. So I can see that Oren has raised his hand and now I'm not sure if I can now activate you, Oren, to say something. Oh, no, it's gone away. Okay. So I'll ask people to post questions in, in the Q&A. Uh, to get things rolling, I might just uh, uh, raise an issue that's been sort of touched on at, at various points. Uh, with such large imaging data sets in the thousands or tens of thousands of people, uh, as, as Carla mentioned, you know, you, you do have the potential for lots of confounds and you sort of lose a bit of control in a way. Um, how do you ensure, what, what are the strategies for ensuring QC when you're doing analyses on such large scale? Um, actually, I, I'm, I'm going to pass this one to Steve because he's been actually, I, I could say something, but I would just be um, giving you a, a worse version of, of what he can say. So maybe, <laughs> maybe meet Steve, everyone. Hey, <laughs> good phone a friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, the, um, and there's no magic answer. 
Um, and so Fidel's just published a paper um, where he, he put a horrible, painful detail into looking at um, literally hundreds of different potential compounds, um, you know, all of which are identified because they have a potentially small or large, but statistically significant effect. Um, and so I think it is a combination of like careful methodology, for example, to include like nonlinear terms and even non-additive terms um where there is sufficiently strong evidence that, that that is necessary which is in the minority but it's there for some effects obviously age and um, needs to have non-linear terms out um, but also trying to think really hard using domain knowledge about this um, and one of the obvious interesting gotchas is the, the whole thing of Bergson's paradox where it's a disaster if you include as a compound and, de and deconfound for something that is actually caused by the variables in, of interest. And then if you do that, uh, you end up inducing uh, association. So you make things worse and not better. Um, and again, you, there are some statistical tests you can do to try and tell you if that's happening, but mostly it comes down to intelligent domain knowledge. Um, yeah, I have a question. <laughs> Thanks. So just following off your question about QC, we have been recently started to use the UK Biobank data. So I just want to know whether how those, whether those imaging has, has already underwent QC process. So if I to download those pre preprocessed and NIFT images, can I just use them straightforward or I need to do uh, my own QC approach? Um, yes, they have been. F Fidel has a semi-automated um, approach for um, marking a, a given modality for a given subject as unusable if, it, if we think it's unusable. Um, and so it should be the case that there is no pre-processed data or imaging derived phenotypes for, for data that is not of sufficient quality. Having said that, uh, with 40,000 subjects, some stuff is going to slip through the gaps. Yeah. And, and so when we, when we then eventually use the IDPs, we do, at the level of working with the imaging derived phenotypes, we do look for standard like outlier tests, and we also Gaussianize the data in general, um, both of which helps then reduce any remaining outlier effects, of which there definitely are some. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm not seeing many people type questions. So I've got a question, Alex, um, and this is for everybody on the panel. Um, one of the things that I often think about is the amount of averaging we do with fMRI or MR data in general, and we lose that sort of sensitivity to individual differences. And I'm just thinking with regards to acquiring such huge amounts of data, and I, that's why I asked that question about sort of the demographic variety and, um, you know, the ethnicity differences and all that. Do you foresee we can get to a point where we're getting like millions of data sets that we can start to produce fingerprints on most of sort of specific profiles that will be more leading to more personalized approaches, you know, translational clinical approaches. Where, where's, what's the big picture with all this, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah, Leanne. <laughs> Leanne. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe like I'm I'm not a big believer in fingerprints, so I'm I'm not sure we'll we'll ever get there. But um, I mean, I do think like one of the um, advantages of such large samples is, mm. like for example, in Enigma, we've we've mainly looked so far um, at case control differences. But actually, the nice things that you could do with such a uh, huge um, samples and so much variation is is to look at individual variation, mm. to look at, mm. um, so things that we're now exploring are normative modeling approaches, um, mm. looking more at individual deviations um, with all the limitations, you know, of the data that we have. Um, so I do think there is scope, you know, to, to work more towards kind of individual differences. Mm. Um, but what we also do find is that the effect sizes of all those effects and individual differences and, and, and even, you know, case control, especially, but even if we look more at individual differences, um, brain age associations, uh, um, 
subtypes, subgroups, they're all very small. So I mm. don't think at the moment that a single kind of imaging feature, at least not like in disorders like depression or, or other psychiatric disorder, will really give us really good biomarkers that we can use in treatment. Mm. Um, maybe if, if, you know, most of this is, of course, based on cross-sectional data. So it could still be that some of these uh, effects with small effect sizes are, are um, predictive of, you know, certain treatment response or outcomes that, that could be. Um, but it's likely that we will need to integrate that with other, many other types of information to, to be, for it to be useful clinically, I think. Yeah. yeah. I'll just uh, say a few things about our PISA study now that we've collaborated with uh, ADNET. And that is um, the bar is uh, really low in what we're trying to achieve compared to what is being done already. So as I said, we're trying to open up um, centres in every capital city and use um, genetics, um, molecular and um, MR imaging to better prove, better select people for clinical trials. So this is what we're up against at the moment. Uh, someone with a many, many, many metal state examination between 22 and 27, right? You go to a memory clinic and your age in your 60s and that's it. In you go to the clinical trial. And um, <laughs> so I'm cheating because I'm saying to these people, look, we can do, we can do a lot better than this with very simple things. You know, Carla was talking about brain age and brain age delta, which I'm also very interested in. Um, we're looking at people who, you know, maybe their, their uh, brain fingerprint in general looks more like someone with MCI and AD. So a postdoc Leone in my group has been doing out of sample prediction from our healthy controls to people with MCI and AD, um, plus possibly amyloid prediction and um, yeah, just, just very basic stuff so that we are already, I'm starting at the very other end of the ambition where we're doing a little bit better than what I think is pretty crude. One of my collaborators in these clinical trials said, oh, we'll just get them to, it was like Donald Trump. I know he's not on, on, on uh, this meeting because he's in a different field. We'll do the Donald Trump test online. He didn't call it that, you know, the, man, camera, person, TV, woman, you know, like three objects and then three minutes later to see if they can recall them. And then if your mini mental state examination is this, this very crude number, in you go to a clinical trial. And I'm like, uh, I don't think we should do that. I think, I think we can do a lot with the data that we've got, mining, prediction, and um, Carly, you also spoke about different modes of brain age, and this is something we're really interested in as well. And I know Leon is here. Early in the course of um, Alzheimer's or late in the course of healthy aging, we seem to do, because we, we're doing similar to brain aging or brain age delta, but we've got cognition in there. We see some people whose brain age looks older in executive function and others in language function and others in memory function. And certainly memory does not seem to be the only path <clears throat> into Alzheimer's disease, according to these multivariate models we're beginning to see, but we're not quite in our studies getting distinct different modes. Yeah, so sorry if it's not quite the fingerprinting answer. I'm just saying, I think we're a lot closer to doing quite a lot better than clinical trial world at the moment, which is extremely um, crude. Um, but we otherwise just do everything that everyone does. We look at data quality as it comes in. We look for outliers when we look at the data, et cetera. No, no magic there. Um, sorry, Carla. Well, well, so Michael, I mean, neither you nor Leanne has quite said it, but I mean, what do you think is the role that this kind of data has to play for? I mean, I guess it is a, a, the more ambitious end of things, which is, you know, transdiagnostic markers, right? Yeah, I think in this area that I showed, which is aging, it's transdiagnostic um, early cognitive or neurodegeneration. I think it's only late in the disease that you see these really classic phenotypes of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. I think early in the disease, when we're working with people with memory clinics, the phenotype is really unstable and it's really quite messy. And um, so it's a really transdiagnostic area. It's the same as early psychosis or 
affective disorders. It's a very amorphous field and there's disturbances that cut across the different diagnostic categories. And it's like an attractor landscape. And later in the disease, the phenotype gets more stereotypical and people go down different ends. It's the same. Some people go down the motor neuron pathway, very simple, similar risk phenotypes go down uh, the frontotemporal dementia pathway. Um, and I saw a paper in Brain today about Parkinson's disease sometimes being brain to gut led and sometimes being gut to brain led. So yeah, if you wind back the disease severity a bit, you're seeing transdiagnostic and, and sort of much more complex abnormal um, imaging phenotypes. Well, that's a wonderful note to, to end. That brings us pretty much to time. Uh, and we'll try to be ruthlessly efficient, just acknowledging that it is quite late uh, down here and people probably have family commitments to move on to. So um, I'd ask everyone to join me in thanking the speakers for some wonderful talks and some really thought provoking uh, data and concepts in terms of how we need to go about our data analysis and a special thanks to Carla and Steve for, for waking up very early in the morning to join us. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, there is going to be a link to a poll that will be sent around to the membership. So please do complete that poll and let us know what topics you would like to see uh, next in the webinars and that will help us guide uh, how we plan these over the next year. Uh, I do notice some people have posted questions to the Q&A. Please, they, they are quite specific, so please feel free to follow up with uh, specific speakers and, and I'm sure they'd be happy to address your questions. Um, but thanks everyone for participating and we hope that you had a great time. I certainly found it interesting and um, we'll see you at the next webinar. Uh, thanks Alex and thanks Rishma too for all your back work organising today and Carla for coming in from Europe. Thanks very Thanks much. Guys. Thanks, Thanks for organizing. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.